الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد So we all just find a place to sit and calm down a little bit so I'll continue inshallah from where I left off last week and today we will most likely um, conclude talking about the Prophet ﷺ's preparations prior to his prophecy. I, I give this part of the seerah a certain amount of emphasis uh, and I take time talking about it because I think it's important and I believe that there is something in it for us to learn from uh, even prior to him becoming uh, Rasulullah because uh, you know prophets and messengers uh, historically didn't become prophets and messengers uh, for, for nothing or without there being reason for them becoming prophets and messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose these people from excellent backgrounds and outstanding families and great upbringings. They, he chose people who had the right recipe uh, within themselves or within their families to be messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be prophets and to re represent His word and His law Jalla Jalalu, throughout, uh, throughout time. And I think you know, it, it, it's worthwhile at least uh, just taking a look at what exactly he went through والسلام, who his parents were, who, her grand, who his grandparents were what, what ethics and values were instilled in him والسلام, as he grew up and what experiences he went through that allowed him to become the man uh, and the person that he later became and I've gone through most of these preparations last time I spent quite a not a sizable amount of, of time talking about his marriage to, to Khadija anha, the importance of, of Khadija anha, as, a, as a critical player in his life والسلام, and, in the, and in Islam itself without Khadija I believe the story would, be, would have been much different much more diff much different than it was uh, than, than the one that we actually have and I believe that Islam would have existed differently if we didn't have Khadija anha, as a part Umm al-Mu'mineen as a part of this story and the love story that, that they had amongst the, between them, the love that he had for her and that she had for him, and the marriage and, and, and the quality and nature of this marriage is something that we're supposed to learn from. We really should take time to understand uh, the amount. And we'll see it because for the next maybe couple of months, uh, the Prophet وسلم, as he becomes a prophet and as he learns more and more and as he moves forward with Islam, Khadija is going to be there every step of the way until she passes. Now, the story that I started talking about last time was the story of Zayd. And I believe it is a really important story, it is very, it is very uh, uh, sentimental. You see, Zayd ibn Haritha ibn Shawahil al Kalbi al Qudai, Zayd came from a, uh, from a northern Arab tribe, uh, from a quite known one, Qudai, it's a very known tribe. And Zayd, as a young, as a young uh, boy, was stolen from his family. Uh, his, uh, they were out. Uh, during a picnic and, and they were raided and Zayd was taken and sold from one person to the other until he was sold to a man by the name of Hakim ibn Hizam ibn Khuwaid ibn Asad ibn Abi Uzza and this is the nephew of Sayyida Khadija and it just happened to be that Khadija was getting married she was getting married to the Prophet sallallahu so Hakim wanted to give his aunt a gift so he gave her Zayd ibn Haritha and then Khadija anha, the gift, gave the Prophet وسلم, Zayd. So now Zayd lives with Muhammad. I'll tell you the story, then I'll ask you a question at the end. Uh, anyways, for years and years, his parents never gave up, never gave up hope that he was alive and continued to look for him. You can only imagine the nightmare that they were going through. Having a child, having, having a child taken away from you is probably your worst nightmare problem. I know it's mine. There's nothing worse that you can possibly imagine than losing a child and not knowing where, they, where, where their whereabouts are. And uh, his father, uh, Haritha, said some of the most uh, beautiful poetry uh, uh, to the point where people of Arabia would, would speak of this poetry, but they didn't know they didn't know who, who necessarily because there were hundreds of that have been taken from their parents. Until his father was able to find, was given information that his son was seen somewhere in Mecca, owned by a man from the uh, from the descendants of Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim, 
So this, he, he became very optimistic because all the sons and daughters of Abu Talib ibn Hashim uh, are people of, uh, are very reasonable people from of great caliber. So he felt that there's a chance that he'll be able to get his, his son back. Because back in the day, it's difficult to, you know, to, to take someone out of... Uh, there weren't laws that governed the land that allowed him to go and claim his son. You have to actually buy his son out of slavery. And in Hadida wasn't a man of wealth, he didn't have a lot of money. So he went to his people, to his tribe and asked uh, for them to fundraise for him, to give as much money as they possibly could. So he gathered a lot of wealth and his poetry had become so, so famous that a lot of people from outside of his tribe gave him wealth. And, and, to the point where he came to Mecca with a lot of wealth. More than he, he, he was very comfortable, that he was definitely going to, want to be able to bring Zayd home. He had more than whatever the, 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 the owner of Zayd was going to ask for. Now Zayd had been with the Prophet وسلم, at that point for a number of years. We're not exactly sure. We think he was taken by the age of five. And we think during this time, uh, because this is at least 10 years later, maybe he was around 16, 15, 16. So he was a young man at the time. Back then, 15, 16, usually you had achieved manhood, you were married, you had a family, you, had, you owned your own business, you did your own thing. Back in the day, that's how things were. So Zayd had lived with the Prophet most of his childhood and his, and his early teens. And his father, Haritha, and his uncle make their way to Mecca. And they ask about Zayd and they figure out that he is owned by name, by the man named Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib. So they go to the Prophet وسلم, and they say, Ya Abu Qasim, Inna hadha ibn Adam, Andak, Qad ukhida minna, Wa qad atainaka bimalin yafuqu thamana, Wa inna nas'aluka, An taruddahu ilayna, Wa atlub ma shi'at nu'atik, we come to Ya Abu Qasim, that was his name, alayhi salatu wasalam. He was called Abu Qasim. Our son is with you. He, you know, he, he's under you. He was taken away from us. And I brought you more wealth than, any, than the price of any, of any uh, 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 slave in, in the land. And we ask you to, to ask for as much money as you want. Just give us our son back. This is prior to his, uh, his prophecy. It's an important story. Because if this story tells you what type of person Muhammad ibn Abdullah was prior to him being a prophet, prior to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making him you know, choose, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him many uh, before uh, all creation existed, but to understand, so it makes sense to you uh, that these choices aren't random. So he said, How about I give you a better option? And what's better than taking, giving us our son and taking whatever you're owed? Now this guy was scared because the best case scenario here is you just give me my son, I give you the wealth and we walk away. There's no better case scenario than this. What are you, and he's, he's a bit scared at this point that maybe the Prophet is going to play, play games with him. What's better than this? I bring him here and you meet him. If he tells me that you're his parents and this is his uncle because I don't know you, you could be scammers and come and take this kid and go. I don't know. I, I need for him to identify that you are his father and this is his uncle. And if he identifies you, I will give him the choice at that point. If he likes to leave with you, then you take him free of, free of judge. I don't want any money. But if he chooses me, I will not kick him out. I will not get rid of him. I won't, I won't throw him out of my home. If he, if he chooses to stay with me. Now it says, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, Of course he's going to choose his, his mother, his father, his, uh, his people. He's going to choose freedom. He's going to go back home. There's no chance in his mind that, in his mind, that uh, Zayn is going to make any other choice. This seems like a, a ridiculous thing that the Prophet is saying, but the Prophet is trying to be very fair. Look, if he chooses you, he's yours. He can go home. Go, he can go wherever he wants. I, I will not hold him. But understand, I will not kick him out. He's old enough to make his choice. I will not get rid of him. I, I don't do that. فَقَالَ حَارِثَ لِلنَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ فَقَالَ وَفَّيْتْ وَصَدَقْتْ This is this is more this is more than fair. This is this is much better. This is amazing. فأتى النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم بزيد. So the Prophet Hassan brought Zayd. فرأى زيد أباه وعمه فعرفهما. And Zayd saw his father and saw his uncle and he recognized them. And of course the, يعني the 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 reunion happened. 
and the tears and the pain and the agony and the years of, of separation and Zaid cried and his father cried and his uncle cried and they spent uh, a, a period of time sharing a moment of love and, and closeness and when they were finished the Prophet said Ya Zaid, هذا أمك وأبوك Is it your father and your uncle? فقال نعم يا أبا القاسم It is It's my father, it's my uncle فقال يا زيد فإني مخيرك أن تعود مع أبيك وعمك إلى قومك وأهلك فإن اخترت ذلك فلك وإن أردت أن تبقى معي فلك I give you the option Zayd you can leave with your, your father and your uncle right? you can, and if you choose to stay you can stay as well you, whatever you want Zayd to do you can do whatever you want to do is fine Just whatever your choice is it's up to you I, I want no wealth from uh, your father and mother I'm not, uh, I'm not selling you or buying you none of that Just whatever you want to do feel free to make, make whatever choice you want to make فيقولون فأجاب زيد دون تردد and then Zayd answered and he, made, and he hesitated none there was no hesitation in Zayd's answer of course I'm taking time to tell you his answer but Zayd didn't take time to answer the Prophet ﷺ. when he asked him this question فقال بل أبقى معك no I stay with you obviously فقال حارثة ويحك يا بني أتبقى معه أتختار عبودية عند, ابن عند, عند بني هاشم على أبيك وعمك وأهلك when you're choosing to stay enslaved by someone from بني هاشم instead of going home with your, with your father and your uncle to your tribe أتختاره على أمك وأبيك you're choosing this person over your mother and your father ما حل بك what is happening to you what's wrong with you فقال أبي لقد رأيت منه ما لم أره من أحد قبل I have seen something from him that I have seen from no one else وإني رأيت منه خيرا لا أختار عليه ولا أفضل عليه أحدا I have seen from him a level of خير that I haven't seen in any other person to the point where I will not and I cannot choose anyone over him I have to stay with him Before he became a Prophet ﷺ, a kidnapped child, deprived from his parents, ten years later, would choose to stay with him. And it wasn't a choice, it wasn't a momentarily choice, it was a temporary choice. It's not like Zayd said this at the moment and went you know, and, and, and slept on it that night, woke up in the morning and said, What did I do? And then no no. Zayd will continue to live the rest of his life with the Prophet ﷺ. He, he, he kept relationship with his parents. He would visit his parents quite, uh, quite often. Meaning the, the, the tie, the kinship, the ties of kinship stayed alive between him and his father and his mother and his uncle. But he stayed with the Prophet ﷺ. Now I ask myself, and I ask you, what is it that he saw from this man? Even though when he, when he answered the question, he said, I saw something. I was so upset when I read this a long time ago. Because he didn't say what he saw. Why didn't you say what you saw? What did you see? I said, you could have ex explained, Ya Sheikh. Describe what you saw. He had nothing to describe. He just said, I saw something. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Here's the thing. Most lectures that you go to in your life, a few years later, you will remember nothing of them. Nothing. I, I, I've attended hundreds of different types of lectures in, in university, formally, informal, in houses, in groups. I can barely remember anything. I just remember how those lectures made me feel. That's all I remember. I just, I just remember the emotions, emotional status that those sittings, those gatherings left me in. And based on that, I have a certain attachment. I'm pretty sure Zayd couldn't, even if he wanted to, he couldn't word and describe verbally what it is that he felt about the Prophet ﷺ that made him choose the Prophet over his own parents after being deprived of their love for many, many years. But it was something inside. It was an emotional response. I, I had to stay with him. Why, I could, why would I choose something different? This is, I am more, I'm happier as a human being than probably anyone else. Even though I have very little wealth and I'm not, I don't even have the social status I need. I don't have my full freedom. But I want to be with this man. I just want to be with him. Sallallahu ala Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see when he stands, uh, later on we, do it, we, we talk about the Isra and Mi'raj. And we'll come to that point where the Prophet ﷺ arrives at a place called Sidrat al-Muntaha. And we get built up because now you're going to see something that no other creation has ever seen before. And I finally tell you what he sees. And I quote for you the verse in the Qur'an. And the verse of the Qur'an goes like this. 
And then the sidra is covered by what? By that which it was covered with. And we sit down and we have no answer. What did you see, Rasulullah? They asked the Prophet that day. What did you see? It was, it was light. Like, I don't know. I don't know what I saw. I have nothing to describe for you. I, have, I saw something that I don't even have the ability to describe for you. And then Zayd does the same thing to us. What was it, Ya Zayd, that made you love this man so much? It's the same thing that will make all the people you would later meet in his life, alayhi salatu wasalam, love him. Which would make the day that he died to the people who knew him the worst day of their lives. The, the, the same thing that made the people after he passed away continue to carry his legacy and to teach his, his law and to spread Islam through the world. And the same thing that makes us 1400 years later gather in a place and listen about him, alayhi salatu wasalam. The same thing. There's something there. I don't know. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال والله ما أنا بالذي أختار عليك أحدا and I would never let you go يا زيد if you choose to stay here I would never let you go ثم أخذ بيده took his hand فذهب إلى صحن الكعبة they walked down and they stood right in front of the كعبة فقال هذا زيد ابني from now on this is my son هو زيد ابن محمد he'll be called زيد ابن محمد أريثه ويرثني he will inherit from me I will inherit from him of course the son came and just changed that point there that that, that, that that little point there doesn't, doesn't happen. He holds on to his name. That's why later on, we know him as Zayd ibn Hari, but not as Zayd ibn Muhammad. But prior to, prior to, the, to Islam coming and bringing that law, it was fine. And Zayd was freed. So he was given his freedom, because you may say, well, maybe because he was a slave, he was scared. No, no, he was given his freedom that day. He could have, he could have the moment he was given his freedom in front of all of Quraysh, said, well, I want to go with my parents. But he didn't. He stayed with the Prophet wasallam. You know what interesting part is that Zayd is. What, what else is interesting about Zayd? Tell me something about Zayd that is unique. No other Sahabi has something that Zayd has. Zayd possesses something that no other Sahabi, no other companion of the Prophet possesses. Do you know what it is? Yes. Yes. So his name is uh, three letters and it's worth 30 hasana every time you say it. Because it's the only name of any Sahabi who we find in the Quran. فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَقَرَى He's the only Sahabi, the only sahabi whose name in the, Quran, is in the Quran. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved him as if he was his own son. Alayhi Salaatu Wasallam didn't have a son. He had two male children who died at a very young age. Al-Qasim and Abdullah. Some uh, narrations say he had a third, but we, we don't know uh, for sure. He, then he had Ibrahim late years and years later from Maria, who also passed away with, within his first year. So the, the, the only son he actually had the, 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 was Zayd. He, he considered Zayd his son. Zayd was known to the Sahaba as Hibb Rasulullah. Hibb Rasulullah means the beloved one to, to Rasulullah. The one that the Prophet like, loves the most. To the point where his son, Zayd's son later, Usama ibn Zayd, the known Sahabi, would be called al Hibb ibn al Hibb. The beloved one, son of the beloved one. تقول يعني فاطمة وفي رواية عائشة أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسل زيدا في مهمة once the prophet sent Zayd on a mission so Zayd left and he فأبطأ عليه he was late he was supposed to be back at a certain time he would tell them عليه الصلاة you leave this day complete the mission by this day you should be back so Zayd was two, three, four days late قال فعرفنا في وجهه ذلك عليه الصلاة والسلام we knew in his face he was worried we knew it in his face that he was very worried. قال حتى كان يوما فأتى زيد until the day came where Zayd came back. فطرق الباب and Zayd you know, knocked the door of the Prophet قال فسمع رسول الله صوته The Prophet heard Zayd's voice. يقول فقام إلى الباب عريانا Meaning he got up and ran to the door and he didn't put on his shirt. And he never did that عليه الصلاة والسلام. He never came to the door in his يعني, uh, t-shirt or whatever. He always came decent عليه الصلاة والسلام to open the door. <laughs> But that day, the Quran, فَمَا رَأَيْنَا صَدْرَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ عَارِيًا إِلَّا يَوْمَهَا It's the only day I saw the Prophet leave his room not wearing a shirt was that day. ذَهَبَ إِلَى الْبَابِ فَبَتَحَ الْبَابِ Open the door. فَاعْتَنَقَ زَيْدًا He took Zayd in a hug. فَقَالَ مَا لَكَ يَا زَيْدِ أَبْطَأْتَ عَلَيْهِ What happened, Zayd? Why were you so hit? What took you so long, Zayd? رضي الله عنه وأرضاه حَتَّى قَالَ أَبُ بَكْرٍ لَوْ كَانَ زَيْدٌ حَيَّ and he used it, I mean, I'm Khalifa, but if Zayd was alive, he would have probably chosen him. لِعِلْمِنَا بِمَكَانَتِهِ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Because we know, we all knew who he was to the Prophet And this is the example I tried to give a few weeks ago. 
When I told you the Prophet ﷺ was an orphan, not once, not twice, but three times. He lost his father, and he lost his mother, and he lost his grandfather. He was orphaned a number of times in his life. And he would teach later, tell us, Ana wa kafiru yati, he would teach us he should take care of orphans. And then he did it in his life before he became a prophet. He took care of Zayd. Zayd to him was a kid who didn't have his parents. So he cared for him and he loved him. And he loved him so much and he treated him well so much that Zayd actually chose him over his own parents. I don't know. I, I don't know if this is even possible. I don't know. But it happened. And it tells you the type of person he was, Ali the, the, the openness of his heart, how easygoing he was, how, how loving he was, how merciful and, and compassionate he must have been, Ali for someone to make that choice. Okay, here's the question I have for you. So if we go back, let's forget all everything I told you right now. All, forget all of that. Let's go back to the day that Zayn was kidnapped. Huh? And Zayn is being carried away. And he's in cuffs, and he's, he, of course he's crying. And, his parents, and you ask Zayd or his parents at, you know, during that period, you say, Zayd, what is the worst day of your life? Obviously, he's going to say, the day I was kidnapped. The worst day of my life, hands down. Even when he was probably living with Hakim ibn Hizam years later, or Khadija, or maybe the first day he was given to the Prophet, before he got to know him. If you ask Zayd, what's the worst day of your entire life? Obviously, it's an obvious answer. The day my son, the day I was taken away from my parents. And then let's fast forward 25 years as Zayd is living in Medina. And you ask Zayd, what was the best day of your life, Yazid? Yeah, uh, or ask him, is the day you were kidnapped, Yazid, still the worst day of your life? Well, if I wasn't kidnapped, I wouldn't have been introduced to Hakim, and he wouldn't have introduced me to Khadija, and she would never have given me to Muhammad Rasulullah. And I wouldn't be Zayd ibn Haritha whose name is in the Qur'an. I'm the only Sahabi who has that. I know that Rasulullah loves me more than everyone, anyone else. That's my nickname. That wouldn't have happened had you not been kidnapped that day. So what are you willing to do? Would you give that day up? Would you go back in time and say I don't want it? No. You see, we can't go back in time. I know we all think it's going to happen one day. It's not. Quote me on that. It's not going to happen. All of you time traveler, yeah, any hopeful people, it's not going to happen. We're not going to time travel. Just accept it and move forward. We're not going to go back in time. We can't change the past. We can't change the past. The past is there just for us to learn lessons, to benefit, to become stronger, to become wiser, <laughs> to become better people. It's all it's. All you really own, all you really possess in this life is right now. That's all we have. We have nothing else. We possess nothing else but the moment that we are sharing right now together. The moment and time and place that we all share right now is all you really have. Everything that has gone before you cannot change, it's there. Don't waste time being, being angry about it, or hateful, or resent. Don't fill your heart with resentment about what happened in the past. <laughs> and you don't know if you, you'll ever, you don't know if you're going to live long enough to see the future that you hope for. What you really have is now, that's all you have. To spend time wondering whether that happened, when it happened, was it good, was it bad. Whether what happened before is good or bad is something that you will determine by how you decide to live the moment you're in right now. Whether what happened in the past is bad or good is determined by the choices you make right now in your life. That's what determines whether what happened in the past was bad or good. It's almost impossible for us to say that something happened in the past was bad or it's impossible to do it. It's hard. You can't do it. Because what you take from your experiences is your choice. You make that choice now. And the extreme example of Zayd, the loved one. Sometimes we go through difficulties and we wonder, we ask questions, why and what could have happened and what happened? What, what are you doing? What's the point of any of this? Why are you asking questions? Why are you questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and questioning something that already occurred? Is it not better that you look back at it and take from it the lesson that you can take from it? And take from it the strength that you can take from it? It really bothers me that as Muslims we can't make, we, we, we fail, we're failing to make these simple decisions. This is what it means to be Muslim. If you break Islam down to its basic yani, elements, this is what it means to be Muslim. We're people who don't have a problem with our past, who are always optimistic about our future, and our acceptance of our, of, of our present. This is, this is who you are as a Muslim, because that's how you understand life. 
that's, that's, that is your perspective of what life is. You can't control the past, it happened. But you learn from it, you build on it, you say Alhamdulillah, you show suffering and you move on, and you make better choices today, and you have optimistic hope for the future. And if you can't do that, then I'm sorry, we didn't take from Islam the basics. You can have the longest sahya that you want to wear the nicest galabiyya and you can pray, but you didn't take the basic fundamental principles from Islam. And I, and I cannot emphasize this point enough. I get these questions all the time. You look at his life, Ali Islam, he lost his father and mother and grandfather, and then he's going to lose yeah, two of his children. And you wonder why all this happened because he had to learn about death, Ali Islam. He had to comprehend death. That's a, that's a big part about being a Muslim, is understanding death, accepting death, dealing maturely with death. And then I, and then I get to, yeah, I, the questions come to me. And I get to watch people. We don't deal with death very well. It strikes me very, I, 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 don't understand, I don't know how to deal with it. When I see people in their 40s and 50s not knowing how to deal with, with death. It's a part of life, it's life. That's what happens. People live and people die, people get sick, people live well, people are poor, people are, yeah, they are wealthy. It's just how it is. There's nothing personal in it. It's just, it's just how things work. You're just in the middle of it so that you can prove your ability to make good decisions regardless of what's happening around you. And that's what it means to be a Muslim. Looking at the experiences he had to go through Alayhi Salaam is important because you learn from them and you, what, the, the, the lessons that he carried with him into his prophecy, he, he things he already had figured out Alayhi Salaam. All right. So you make a choice. Is it worst day or best day? I don't know. I'm not saying this is the best day of his life. It just happened. I'm not asking you to say, oh, the day he was kidnapped was the best day. That is rude. That was a day of pain and agony and day's life. No one's asking him to say it's the best day of your life. But you can't go around saying it's the worst either. Because things lead to other things and it just happened in your past. Learn from it and move on. Just move on. And don't get tangled up in something you can't change anymore. All right. Final preparations of his life before his prophecy, Ali Wasallam. He needed testimony. What does that mean? Well, if he's going to come and bring a prophecy forward, Ali Salatu Wasallam, he's going to, if he's going to say, "Ana Rasulullah, I'm a messenger from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala." Given all the messengers since Ibrahim Ali Salam had been in Bani Israel, all of them, all of them sons of Ishaq and Yaqub and Yusuf. Sulaiman and Dawood and Musa and Isa and Yahya, all them, all them sons of Ishaq alayhi salam. It was only Ismail alayhi salam was a prophet, so he's going to come for his name, Rasul. Doesn't, doesn't fit. Doesn't fit Muhammad. You know, you know, that's how it's going to sound. So if he comes and says that, it's going to be very easy for everyone around, around him to say, oh, you're, you're, you're lying. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted that to be, to change that. How? To, to get the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam a formal testimony from all the nobles of Quraysh regarding his ethics. That was going to happen. Another thing was going to happen. Prove to himself and those around him his ability, his leadership abilities, and his management abilities. How is this all going to come forward? In the story of building the Kaaba. You see, a, a, a sail happened, which is basically um, a flood. Um, and parts of the Kaaba fell, and the Kaaba hadn't been rebuilt in a long time, and, and, and a few walls had fallen, uh, caved in, and it looked, it didn't look right. So the, uh, the Quraysh came around, all the nobles stood in front of the Kaaba and said, we have to rebuild this, and we have to start rebuilding this, we can't, we can't just get the walls that fell down to stand up again, we have to actually bring the whole thing down and build it again, so that so it just doesn't keep on happening, because the Kaaba would just fall every year, a part of it would fall in, and they would just kind of fix it up, but now the damage was too severe, so they had to rebuild the Kaaba all over again. So they stand there, all of them, Abu al-Hakam ibn Hisham, and Abu Sufyan, Sakhr ibn Harb, and Uthba ibn Rabi'a, and Shayba ibn Rabi'a, and Ubay ibn Khalaf, and Umayyad ibn Khalaf, and the Walid al-Mughira and al al Wa'il, all these big names. And the Walid al-Mughira at the time was probably the head of the, he was, he was the, the elder of them all. And he stood there and he said, okay, let's start. Everyone pick up an axe and let's start, you know, bringing it down. And, and everyone was like, yes, let's do it. All right, let's do it. And they stood around. And he said, okay, you know, pick up, let's, let's start you know, rebuilding the Kaaba. Yes, let's start rebuilding the Kaaba. And they all stood around. And it was becoming very awkward. And it became very apparent that no one dared no one dared touch the Kaaba. Why? Because they saw what happened to the last person who tried to bring down the Kaaba. 
They weren't going to try that again. They saw what happened to Abu Rahman not too long ago. It had only been maybe 25 years since they, most of them had actually witnessed it with their own eyes. They saw what happened to Abu Rahman's army. Like, yeah, I'm, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be the second person to, to whack the Kaaba. How about you be the first? And they, no one would do it. And so Walid al himself said, I'll do it. So they pick up the axe and say, Allahumma, innaka ta'lam annana la nuridu illa al khayr. Oh Allah, you know that we only want khayr. Before we continue, Al Walid was a pagan or non Muslim at the time. Whether he worshipped Aslam or not, we don't know, but he wasn't someone who, who followed the Prophet, at least not during the Prophet's life. Yet he knows Allah, so that's an important point. That they knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also the Quran. If you ask them who created the, the, the cosmos and the earth, they'll say Allah. They just they, they, they perform shirk, unfortunately. Meaning the, the, the law of Ibrahim got manipulated and changed. It, it wasn't pure anymore. They made mistakes. They said, they said things they shouldn't be saying. They, you're behaving the way they should have been behaving. That's one thing. Another thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the intention of someone who's not Muslim. It's an important point to remind yourself of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the intentions of people who are not just, who just don't have to always be Muslim. They can be something else. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept their intentions. And He said those words, and He hit the Kaaba, and everyone ran. Everybody ran and left. And in what even we put down the axe and said, if I come back tomorrow, if I'm not struck by lightning, or if I don't die from some cause, then we'll continue this. So I'll go into home and wait until the next morning. It would seem to be okay. Everything was fine. And they continued to bring down the rocks and rebuild the Kaaba. Until they came to the riwayah. Until they came to the riwayah. Until they came to green rocks in the, in the foundation, they left them and they started to build on top of them. As they built, all the walls were you know, going smoothly. But everyone's, everyone's eye was on one part. There was one part of the Kaaba that they were leaving almost subconsciously to the end. And everyone was kind of watching the other person to see, is anyone going to touch the, uh, the rock? No one's touching it yet, it's all right, good. I'll continue to build this wall, but the moment that when someone touches that rock, I'm going to come in. And when the Hajar al Aswad, the black rock, in fact, when you go to the uh, to Umrah, you try and get in, but you know it's hard to it's hard to. We didn't get to do it. One of the blessed rocks of Jannah that uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent for Ibrahim to add to the Kaaba as he was building it. When it was the the time to put the Hajar al Aswad in in the Rukun, the first person was like, "I'll put it in." You seem very tired. Take a rest, I'll take care of it. No, no, it's okay. It's okay, I'm fine. You, you, you rest, I'll do it. No, no, I insist, you rest. No, I insist, you rest. Two minutes later, they had, the swords were out and they were putting them in, in red paint and they were calling upon blood and calling their... And, 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 and war was going to start. Real fighting was going to begin. They brought buckets of blood and they put their hands in the blood. And that was like a... Uh, a signal or a symbol that they're ready to fight till the death about who's going to put this rock in its place. Why? Because it's charuk. There's a lot of there's a lot of integrity. Forever they will speak of the person who will put this place, the, the, the black rock, back into its place. And everyone wanted that uh, that reputation that we are we are the tribe that put it back in. And no one's going to give up that reputation. And they fought, and, it came, and things very, came very close to an actual war. Until so Walid Mughira said, "How about we don't do this? How about we just..." You know, we, 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 we play this by luck. The first person to walk through the door of, of, of the haram is the person who chooses who's going to put the, the black rock in. Is everyone in agreement? Everyone's in agreement. And obviously, the universe who is owned, which is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, this is how subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, kind of moves things. And the person who was going to walk through that door uh, was Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had no idea what was going on. He actually helped them uh, build the Kaaba. He, he and his uncle Abbas were a part of building the Kaaba, but not every day, not all the parts. And when it came to that part, they weren't interested in the reputation, they didn't care, so they left it. And then he came back to see what's happening. Ali as was in, walks in, and he's the person to walk in. So what does Quraysh say? So you know, the, you, you know how the story ends, but the, the important part is what they say. All of Quraysh, all different tribes and all backgrounds, they would say the same thing. That is the trustworthy one, the honest one. We accept. We accept his judgment. He can judge. He can make whatever judgment he wants. We accept him. 
We accept his honesty and his integrity and his trustworthiness. I mean, and this would be testimony for him, alayhi salatu wasalam, for the rest of his life. People would know him as Al-Amin from that day on. So later, when he came and said, Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, when he came and recited upon them the Qur'an and he reminded them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of the law of Ibrahim alayhi salam, they couldn't say, no, hey, you're a liar. You've always been a liar. No, you just, test- you just testified a few, a few days ago. It was only a couple of months ago that in front of all of Quraysh, just before a war happened, you said he's Al-Amin. He's a trustworthy one. You're going to go back now? It doesn't work. Either he is this or that. You can't have it both ways. So they weren't able to call him a liar to his face, alayhi salatu wasalam, at least at the beginning. They would do it later, but not at the beginning. They couldn't do it at the beginning. And that made a difference for him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is setting things up for him, alayhi salatu wasalam. So now to see his, his management. So he comes and he finds uh, them fighting and people have their hands in blood. And tension is up and people feel very upset. And adrenaline is, is, is in the blood and everyone's ready to fight. So Ali wants to kind of diffuse this, all this. So what he does is he takes his own abaa, he puts it on the ground and he picks up the, the rock and he puts it in the middle. Then he makes a couple of, of knots at the sides. And he calls representatives from all the major tribes that were going to fight. And he asks each and every one of them to pick up one of the sides of the, uh, of the Aba, of the piece of clothing. And now all of them are standing there, kind of squished together, carrying a rock in a, in a, And he tells them, okay, do tawaf around the Kaaba seven times. Now at the end of those seven times, they couldn't care less who was going to put this rock there because they couldn't take extra breath anymore. He, he diffused all the anger and all that, uh, all that tension, but he's having tawaf. After seven times, because they didn't say, no, we won't do tawaf. This is, a, this is an action of Ibrahim. This is something that is, that, is, that is considered a great act of worship, even to the Jahiliya people. So they carried it. When they were doing tawaf, at the end of the seven times, they were tired, they were breathless, and they were ready for any judgment he was going to give. Ali Islam was down just, they, just as long as they could rest and sit down. At the end of the seventh uh, rotation on the Kaaba, Ali Islam was said to bring the rock close to his place. So they did. They lifted it up, and then from under the Aba, Ali Islam, he put it in with his own hands. Sallallahu Alaihi and he prevented a war. He was preventing wars, alayhi salatu wasalam, way before he became a prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So don't, don't listen, don't even give you know, the time of the day to those who, who, who tell you, alayhi salatu wasalam, was out for blood later. He was diffusing wars way before he became a prophet, sallallahu alayhi salatu wasalam, and keeping the peace. And people walked away happy after that day. And he showed a certain skill set of, of leadership and management to them as well. And he took testimony, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm going to take a few minute break because I'm thirsty. Uh, the final point I'll make, inshallah, before we uh, finish up today. The point I left for the, till the end. Interestingly enough, as they were building the Kaaba, or rebuilding the Kaaba again, they made a, uh, a condition uh, for build, rebuilding it. They said that, فَلَا نَبْنِيهَا إِلَّا بِمَالٍ حَلَالٍ وَلَا نَبْنِيهَا وَلَا يَدْخُلُ فِي بِنَائِهَا مَالٌ مِنْ حَرَامٍ فَلَا يَدْخُلُ فِي بِنَائِهَا مَالٌ مِنْ سِفَاحٍ وَلَا مَالٌ مِنْ غَارَةٍ وَلَا مَالٌ مِنْ رِبَا So amongst the conditions they made when they built, they rebuilt the Kaaba was that they would only use wealth that came from a halal source and you may be wondering, halal source? You must be mistaken because the Prophet ﷺ wasn't a Prophet yet True! But they still knew what halal wealth was and what, what haram wealth was. Even prior to, to, to the Prophet ﷺ bringing the law and explaining the Qur'an and for them learning the details, they knew, they knew that if you steal the money that you have isn't, isn't halal wealth. You know if you take it against someone's will, you, it's not halal wealth. They know if you took it from riba, if you use, if, if, if you use if, if you shark loan someone and you made interest just on a loan that this, mad, this wealth wasn't halal, so they said that we will only use wealth that we brought from halal. So they had to go home and figure out which part. So they knew that this wealth was halal. They just didn't make the right choices. And if they knew that, you know, back before he was a prophet, sallallahu alaihi wa I wonder what, 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 what the problem we have is, really. Ali salatu wasalam explained this point to the point where he had no more, nothing more to say. And the Qur'an came and talked, talked about it so many times that we really have no excuse Yawm Al-Qiyamah if we allow our, our houses uh, to be built on or we allow into our houses wealth that we know did not come from a halal source. It's important. It's important that you ask the questions uh, about where you work and what you do. 
Ask the questions so that you know. So what, what you do and where you're making your money is the way that you're making your money halal or not. To many of you, the answers will be more open and easy than you thought. And to some of you, it will be the opposite. You'll be surprised that you can't do this and you can't do that. And for others, you'll be surprised at the opposite. There's actually much more that you're allowed to do Islamically than you are led to believe. But it's important to know the limitations of wealth. Why? Because he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, in a hadith, salatu sahih, قَالْ كُلُّ مَا كُلُّ لَحْمٍ نَبَتَ مِنْ سُحْتٍ فَالنَّارُ أَوْلَى بِهِ All flesh that is, that is built to a man that is haram, well, then punishment is, is, is more likely where it's going to go. Be, be aware. Be aware what you feed your children, what you bring home, yani back, 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 back to your spouses. Be aware what you push your spouse to do because you want more money or want more wealth. Be very, very aware. Be careful. Um, when Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas would ask the Prophet وسلم, yani about, uh, about dua for something, so his, his answer was, alayhi salatu wasalam, Make sure that every يعني, لقمة, every time you eat, that what you're eating is halal, comes from a halal source, you didn't hurt or harm anybody, you didn't take it from a source that you knew you shouldn't have taken it from, and your da'wah will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith, you will say, alayhi salatu wa a man will come and he, he look at him, he is very humble in, in the way, in his appearance, humble in his heart. And he says, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, he called upon Allah, Oh my Lord, Oh my Lord. But he eats from haram, he drinks from haram, and he dresses from haram. How does he hope that any of his dua is going to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They knew this when they were rebuilding the Kaaba. Because at that point they couldn't mess around. You can lie about your personal life. But when they came to the Kaaba, they were too afraid. They couldn't come and say, Oh, I'll be able to Kaaba. They knew, I, we have to make sure everybody, do not bring to the Kaaba, we're building the Kaaba here. Do not bring wealth that is not halal. I, I'm saying it to myself, I'm saying it to all of you. So they said, yes, yes, we, we, we know, we'll, 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 we'll take care of that. We won't bring anything that's halal. We just have to go figure out what part of our wealth isn't. 1400 years later, after the Prophet he taught us this, so many times, the Qur'an made this very uh, extremely clear. I, I can't give ourselves excuse. I don't know where to get an excuse from. For you to allow into your home, into, the, in, into your stomach, and into the stomach of your children, something that's not halal, no matter how difficult it is. You see, this only becomes an issue when money is a problem. This only becomes something that has importance when you don't have much wealth. When you have wealth, of course, when you have means to make easy to make money from a halal source, this is not a big deal. But when things aren't going your way, and it's a bit tight, that's when you have to hold on to these ethics, and you don't accept haram into your home. And if you're someone who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given an excess of wealth, help your brothers and sisters out. Help them make the right choice. Don't force your brothers and sisters into a situation where they have to choose between taking haram money, money that's not, wealth that is not proper, or going or not being comfortable financially. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given, that's how the dynamic of Muslim societies work. Those who have take care of those who don't. We're, we're, just if you're not if you if you've never taken haram money in your life, say Alhamdulillah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not put you in a hard situation. Alhamdulillah. That doesn't mean that you, you're gonna walk away clean from this. If Muslims around you are doing it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you excess but you don't really think or feel that it's upon you to make it easier for them. To make their choice of cho choosing only halal easier, it, it, it's a part, it's something, we are all responsible for this. We don't, I, 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 my theory is we don't seem to understand this point very well, as Muslims. We don't seem to understand that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easier for you in any field, that it becomes a responsibility upon you to make it easier for people in that same field. That is your job. Why do you think He gave you more than He gave others? Why, because he loves me and you more than he loves others? No! He just said that you can use this for the right cause. So you can help someone who wasn't given. What did the kuffar say? Listen to what the kuffar say. وَقَالَ يَذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنُطْعِمُوا مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَ Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to feed someone whom Allah, if he wanted, he would have fed them? Allah gave them one, he gave me a million. He could have given them a million. He didn't. You want me to feed someone that Allah chose not to feed? This is their argument. 
So by any moment, any moment in your life, you think for a second like that, this is exactly what the Prophet said in the Quran. It's a surah that you read all the time. We, we, you know, we love surah Yasin. We'll read that point. And that guy is kind of just forgotten or jumped over because it's not as. But I think this is most, probably the most important verse in the whole surah. So they refuse to rebuild the Kaaba, except using money that came from a halal source. I will end with that, inshallah. And uh, next week, uh, we get to talk about the final preparations. Next week is a lot of fun because we get to talk about some choices he'll make, alayhi salatu wasalam, and we'll build up to the moment that really important and big moment uh, in his life, alayhi salatu wasalam, and ours. I hope that was helpful. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 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 wa s